I'm Nancy Gibbs. I'm the faculty director here at the Shorenstein Center. And I am delighted to have a chance for us to celebrate the really extraordinary investigative journalism uh, that the Goldsmith Prize honors every year. This prize, this chance to call attention to the enterprise and the ingenuity and the energy of our newsrooms, I think grows more important by the year. As, as newsrooms, especially smaller local ones, contend with ever greater economic pressures, their commitment to this kind of accountability journalism is all the more precious and all the more in need of, of protection and of, of celebration. Our finalists today for this prize come from all over the country. They've reported stories on everything from egregious miscarriages of justice to appalling bureaucratic indifference and incompetence to um, the ineptitude or dangerous lack of oversight. Um, to the contents of the very air we breathe if we have the misfortune of living in one of the country's cancer hot zones. You can read more um, about our finalists, about their work, and about the, the processes behind these stories on the Shorenstein site. We'll drop this in the chat and um, on our journalists resource site where our reporters have gotten the story behind the story. And that's what we're going to get a chance to hear directly from our finalists today. I'm going to give each of them a chance to tell you the story that they presented and what went into uncovering it, uh, verifying it, and presenting it. Uh, but first, let me quickly thank the Greenfield Foundation, which makes this award possible, our extraordinary panel of judges. I feel like every year the job gets harder to narrow down more than 170 entries to these six finalists. Each of them will receive um, a $10,000 prize and we will announce the $25,000 winner at our in-person celebration next Tuesday, April 6th. For those of you who are not here on the Harvard campus, we will be live streaming that um, and also use that as a chance to celebrate not only all of this incredible work, but the career, our Career Achievement Award winner, Michelle Norris. I also wanna thank the team at Shorenstein, especially Liv, Liv Schwartz and Lindsay Underwood for managing what is a very uh, long and complicated process so smoothly and giving us a chance to come together and um, dig into this work. So with that, each of our finalists is gonna get a chance to talk a little about the, about the story and the process behind it. And then I'll throw this open to you to be able to ask them questions, either using the Q&A function or raising your hand and I will ask you directly. Uh, let's start with uh, Raquel Rutledge from the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, whose story um, wires and fires um, made me as a, as a homeowner um, have a much greater appreciation of what we do and do not know about what causes fires in this country and particularly the communities that are most likely to suffer from failure to adequately police the quality of wiring and the way the fires are reported and accounted for. So Raquel, welcome to uh, the Shorenstein Center, welcome to the Kennedy School and tell us your story. Thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. We are very honored uh, on behalf of John Diedrich, my teammates, and uh, Daphne Chen. Um, just really grateful uh, that you're um, acknowledging this work. And so, um, yeah, this story is one of those things that started, um, was on my mind a number of years ago when I first started noticing um, the way that fires are handled in Milwaukee, which just seemed to be um, not very seriously taken. And we wondered, um, you know, we'd have these fatalities and then um, everyone would just move on. You'd see a blurb in the paper that said um, suspected electrical fire, but you'd never hear about it again. And we just started wondering, are these actually accidents? They were treated as accidents. And so we started to sort of question that premise. Um, and as we started to dig in and look at the reports and read and compile the information, I mean, we were just astounded at um, I think some assumptions that most people have in the United States is that um, when fires happen and when there's fatalities that um, the people that the, they are investigated and they're that you get to the cause of them. And what, the first thing we found is that um, that's just simply not true, that um, the investigators go in and they just they might suspect it's electrical, but then they'll leave it at that. 
and they will they will call it undetermined because they don't have electrical engineers. Um, they don't have at the, at the local state and even um, well at the state level where you think the investigators are um, equipped to do that, and they don't unless they suspect there is a crime. So if there's not a homicide or an arson, um, they pretty much leave it, and so that. Um, that there's no accountability for those. So that allows the landlords to say, hey, there was no electrical fire there. I don't know what happened over there. And so that um, so that continues the problem. Um, they also, you know, one of the things that the fire inspector said is that they leave it to others to be able to determine that. And the others that they are talking about are insurance companies. So this is the next finding that was sort of astounding to us was that um, you know, insurance companies do have a vested interest, of course, in finding the cause of these fires, and they do have electrical engineers. But um, what we found is that um, in Milwaukee, um, these homeowners or property owners don't have insurance often. So they, they're renting these properties that are not insured. So there's no underwriting, there's no inspection at the front end to say, hey, this is worthy of, you know, we can insure this um, because it's safe. Um, so a lot of the homes that are being purchased for people to live in are bought for sometimes ten or twelve thousand dollars, and so they're not insured. Um, and so then, when there's not insured, there's again another reason, another area where the investigation falls short, um, and there's again no accountability because of that. So then, what we found as we kept looking at this is that the data. Um, are just woefully inadequate. So when you try to track down where these fires happen, um, what causes them, again, local, state, and federal level, um, it's just not there. So like we came across a family, uh, two people who were killed in a fire suspected to be electrical. Um, and this is kind of what started this, this um, prompted us to really dig deeply into this, um, was that um, that property was not insured and, um, and then those deaths weren't even counted. When we tried to check the database um, to see, to, to figure out where their deaths were in there, they weren't included. So we realized that these voluntary systems of reporting these fatalities, um, you know, had just a, a fraction of the actual number of deaths. So we had, this is what one of the challenges. So Daphne Chen, amazing um, data person, um, we, we, build our own, we built our own databases to figure out where these deaths were, um, figure out, read through all the reports to figure out were they suspected electrical because again, the federal database didn't have it. It was empty, empty fields. And so um, when we put all that together, the other, another finding was that um, these suspected electrical fires happen disproportionately um, in the most impoverished zip code in Milwaukee and then sort of radiate out from, from that area. Um, five times as many um, suspected electrical fires are happening in our, our most distressed neighborhoods. So that was something that nobody had been paying attention to, no one knew. Um, and so from there, we went, um, after we figured out that it was, it, it was affecting renters. So it's African-American renters in Milwaukee are the ones most impacted by this. Um, and so then we figured out, well, how is that, how can that be happening? And um, so then we started looking at the Department of Neighborhood Services, which um, oversees the uh, property code violations and that sort of thing, we realized that um, they too were not doing their job properly, not enforcing the violations. So we'd have these rental properties that were, um, you know, available for lease being advertised as, you know, places to, to, to come and live. And um, they had multiple, multiple code violations that were open at the time of, of being leased. And so there was very little enforcement to the fact, to the point where arrest warrants were actually issued for some of the property owners because they had been neglecting their properties and yet they were still able to, um, to lease them out. So um, that was another area of a shortcoming. And we, what we also found is that they had dismantled their inspection program. So they used to have uh, an inspection program for rental properties in distressed neighborhoods. It was limited, but it, there was early signs that it was successful. And some state legislators over the years had many of whom were landlords themselves um, passed laws that uh, really dismantled, actually banned the ability to do proactive rental inspections. Um, so that was, um, that's, you know, that's where you saw some of this stuff, um, the problems increasing after that. And then, um, gosh, I haven't even, I'm, I'm, I don't wanna ramble, but there's a couple more quick things I'll tell you about it is, so once they dismantled their program, we realized, okay, 
how can we do what they're not doing? What government isn't doing? Is there a way that we can get a picture of this and we can look at what's actually, what the risk is out there? So we hired an electrical engineer and we worked with um, Marquette University uh, over to make sure that we, we set up a, a statistically valid random study to get an idea of what the risk really was um, in this community. So then we hired this electrical engineer, um, randomly selected 50 homes, and then we started knocking on doors in the neighborhoods and just saying, hey, are you interested in having um, your you know, electrical system inspected? It's free. Um, and people were really grateful. It was, it was amazing to us how many people were really thankful to see that people do care. I feel like it's a population that's been very overlooked in our community. So we went in there and we found at the end of the day, after crunching all that um, information, that 80% of all those homes, it, it was could be expected to have serious electrical code violations. Um, so it was, it was a crazy finding um, to imagine that people are living at this heightened risk. And then the last thing, and then I'll wrap it up, is that we found that taxpayer subsidies are also supporting this. So we looked at, we had some data leaked to us, and then we also had some public records to compile all the taxpayer money that is going to these very properties that have open code violations. So just perpetuating the problem um, and, and, and no one had been paying attention to it. So Raquel, I would have thought that um, it's in the city's interest to enforce code violations, if not just in the interest of people's safety, then in the interest as a, as a revenue issue um, to collect fines. And yet I gather from the story that, you know, one of the people for whom there's ultimately an arrest warrant still has, there, are no, there have been no consequences. So what has the impact of your series been? Yeah, thank you for asking that. Yeah, it's, I mean, the governor called our findings gut-wrenching. Um, they have been swift at the city and state level to come up with, you know, to come up with uh, solutions to this. At the city council level, they're talking about mandating insurance, that, that rental property owners carry insurance. So that would lead to better investigations. They're also talking about um, re, uh, reinstating the rental inspection program. There need to be some state legislative changes um, to make it widespread, but even state legislators, even some of whom had voted earlier to dismantle the program, are now talking about ways of needing to fix this. So there are some things um, underway right now we've been covering, following up with it, that um, are potential fixes to it. Uh, thank you. You use the word gut-wrenching. I would say that absolutely, especially for any apparent, applies to our next story, which is juvenile injustice in Tennessee. Um, Nashville Public Radio News, WPLN News, and ProPublica um, did this extraordinary investigation into how juvenile justice was carried out in Tennessee. And Maribel Knight is here to tell us that story. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you so much to the Schwarzenegger Center for this unbelievable recognition. Um, I'm here uh, on behalf of my team, which is uh, Ken Armstrong. Uh, and I did this story, I'm with Nashville Public Radio. So the story really began in 2016, kind of we open it with this chaotic scene in which three officers are in an assistant principal's office in Tennessee, in a county called Rutherford County. And they're there to arrest these elementary school girls, all of whom are black. And they are kind of fighting over whether they're supposed to arrest them or not. At any rate, um, they, it was a traumatic scene. One girl threw up, one girl falls to her knees. In all, there were 11 children arrested. Uh, and the reason why those arrests took place, um, which our story outlines, is that they were all being accused of something called criminal responsibility, which, as it turned out, was not a charge. But the whole reason why the officers were there that day is because of fight a video of a, of a kind of a scuffle between some very young children had been posted on YouTube a few weeks before, and uh, the police officer decided to investigate, or a police officer, and ultimately charged 10 children with criminal responsibility for not stepping in to stop this fight. Uh, those children were swiftly taken to the detention center. Some of them were released. Some of them were held up to two days. And uh, really, this incident um, sparked national outrage. It was, it was written about, and then it kind of died down. And I had always been really interested in kind of what was the story behind this. I mean, surely something terrible had gone on that day. And it seemed much bigger than just a blunder, you know, a single blunder. 
And uh, ultimately, what our story um, wrote about and revealed was that these arrests were part of a much larger and unsettling culture in this county around juvenile justice. Um, they had been, they meaning the county, uh, had been illegally arresting and illegally jailing children for years. Um, this is really more than two decades of mass incarceration of children. And it was all under the watch of a single juvenile court judge, Donna Scott Davenport, who had been the county's first and only juvenile judge. So they established this court in, the two th in 2000, and she was elected, and she has been the judge ever since. And um, up until this incident in 2016, she had directed police on what she called our process, which basically was uh, saying that every single child arrested, uh, even for minor things like truancy, um, must first go to jail, and then the jail would decide to hold them or not. And this is a judge uh, writing this to law enforcement. So she directed law enforcement on this process, which is pretty extraordinary. Um, under her, she also appointed the jailer. So the judge sits on top of this entire system. She oversees the court and she oversees the jail. And under her, the jailer named Lynn Duke, uh, who's been in power almost as long, um, had a process in play called the filter system. And that's what was sucking in so many children. Essentially, the state puts really narrow limits on what children can be detained. Uh, but the but Lynn Duke and the detention center had their own system called the filter system and her jail locked up any child it deemed a true threat, although in the manual, there was no definition of what that meant. So it was really open to interpretation. And from a numbers perspective, um, what this meant was that this county was locking up children at an extraordinary rate. At one point, they were locking kids up at 10 times the state average, meaning that 48% uh, of all the juvenile cases that were referred to the court ended up in detention. And that number actually continued to rise until a federal court intervened. So what our story did was kind of take this big incident and then all these lawsuits that came in the wake, uh, which were seven federal lawsuits, and we began to kind of triangulate all of these lawsuits. Uh, and along with my reporting partner, Ken Armstrong, we were really able to crack the door open on this very secretive and private system of juvenile court. You know, juvenile court is a place that it, the records are sealed. Um, and I can talk about that as a reporting challenge, but you know, you really can't get behind this place. You can't get access to records. Um, and because of that, you know, it really is, it's supposed to protect the children. And there's good reason for that. But what we found really was that it was protecting all of these adults. And so, what this story ended up being was a very, very punitive and harsh system uh, regime that had been going on for decades that really doled out harsh consequences that did not comport with state or federal law um, to children. Meanwhile, the adults had faced absolutely no consequences themselves. And at the time of our story, you know, this was a system that was still growing. Um, the that this year, the county increased its budget by 23%. You know, this was something that while a judge had made a lot of the decisions and a jailer had made a lot of the policies in play, um, it was a county that by and large had so many people that were complicit in this county commissioners who approved budgets, who didn't ask, ask questions, even uh, defense attorneys who didn't push hard for their clients, prosecutors, um, it, you know, the list goes on. Um, one of the most interesting kind of weird quirks that Ken and I found uh, was that the reason why all these children uh, were charged with the charge that they had, which was criminal responsibility, which I said is not a real charge, it's actually a prosecutorial theory. So one can be charged with, say, assault under the theory of criminal responsibility, meaning they were there, an assault took place, and because they were complicit in that, they will then be charged with assault. You can't just charge someone with criminal responsibility, but on every single one of the petitions these children had, which were like the warrants, um, it said criminal responsibility. And the people who decided that charge were not who you might think. It was not the prosecutor. 
it was um, a little known middle person uh, called judicial commissioners who have a very strange role in Tennessee, where they actually decide the charges. Um, and what Ken and I learned um, is that in Rutherford County, along with the vast majority of counties in Tennessee, these judicial commissioners are acting like prosecutors and judges without the training of either. They do not have to go to law school. They don't even have to have a college degree. And so the two individuals who were making the decision about these children um, were vastly underqualified. Um, and, you know, what was really interesting from a reporting standpoint was that we had these seven federal lawsuits, but we also had the underlying materials for a police investigation that took place after this huge arrest. It, it was such a dust up, it was such a, you know, it was such a black mark on the county's reputation that um, they did an investigation, a police investigation into it. And they interviewed all these people uh, who were touching the situation in one way or another, the principal, all the arrest trusting officers. Um, we got all of the audio interviews from that. So that was a huge get for us. It was 38 hours of audio interviews with all of the officers involved, all of the all of the adults, really. Um, and that was hugely important to reconstructing the narrative. This is a very narrative driven story with a kind of very powerful scene at the top. And we were able to really get inside the minds of every single person who was in that office that day who was dealing with this because of the access to that tape. But I will say they interviewed 20 people. Uh, this is the police department uh, in Murfreesboro in Rutherford County, as well as um, they did a parallel investigation with Nashville. So Nashville came in to kind of help uh, investigate as part of the transparency. And the only two individuals who did not participate in this uh, investigation were the judicial commissioners. They refused. Um, so what you see is, is this kind of, um, vast array of adults who have not uh, complied with any rules and regulations or most, you know, the most important ones, uh, they face no consequences. Um, and really, um, what Ken and I kept talking about as the themes of this uh, were absolutely the lack of accountability and this notion of complicity. You know, these children were all told that they were complicit in something that they should be punished for. Meanwhile, all of these adults were complicit in a much larger and much more um, traumatic system for these children, and it went on for decades. So um, I'll, I'll also note that the story has had a pretty significant impact. Um, uh, days later, the uh, the judge, uh, Donna Scott Davenport, had been an adjunct uh, instructor at MTSU, the local university. She'd been there for a number of years, since the 90s. Uh, they cut ties with her. Um, she actually, uh, not too long ago, in late January, announced that she would be stepping down and not seek re-election. Um, and also, after our reporting, uh, 10 members of Congress uh, wrote a letter to Merrick Garland at the Department of Justice asking for an investigation. Uh, uh, the governor of Tennessee uh, asked them to do a review into Rutherford County, and then state lawmakers also filed a resolution to, some state lawmakers filed a resolution to oust the judge. So there has been a significant um, impact, um, although I keep coming back to the fact that um, just taking down one judge is not going to fix, you know, what is ultimately a really broken system. I mean, that Judge Davenport is a character out of Dickens, you know, the judge who failed the bar <laughs> exam four times before finally passing on her fifth and yet presiding over, she called herself the mother of the county, uh, yeah. just that her idea about how you should treat children in order that they, you know, learn discipline is so harrowing to read about, you know, a, an eight-year-old girl put in handcuffs at school of, you know, what that does to a child is just, it is, as I say, it was a gut-wrenching story to read, really, really extraordinary. Um, also, uh, equally harrowing in such different ways, um, anyone who wants to check where your residence sits uh, in relationship to um, Industrial air pollution can thank Leila Yunus and her team at ProPublica in collaboration with the Texas Tribune and Mountain State Spotlight for their extraordinary piece, Sacrifice Zones, Mapping Cancer-Causing Industrial Air Pollution. So Leila, can you tell us what was involved in getting that much data and being able to present it um, and the people affected by it in the way that you did? Sure. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me. I um, also represent 
uh, quite a large team of reporters. We were nine in total. And so um, I'm just one of, of a big group um, and a sort of cross newsroom collaboration. Um, the idea for the story actually began um, with a previous investigation that we did with the Times Picayune and the Advocate of New Orleans. Um, that investigation was a 2019 story about Cancer Alley, Louisiana, which is kind of this famed stretch of land um, along the lower Mississippi River that um, is full of industrial plants. Um, I actually am from Louisiana and just growing up used to hear a lot about it and kind of enjoyed driving through it because it looked so spooky. Um, but, um, you know, got older and, and started to hear a lot of stories about the health effects that people were experiencing down there. When we started working with the Times Picayune and the Advocate, one of the things that really struck me was that there was still kind of an open question about the actual quality of the air in South Louisiana. And the state um, and industrial representatives used to kind of talk about, oh, well, the cancer rates in this part of the state are not meaningfully different from the rest of the state. Now, um, cancer data in Louisiana, like like it is in most states is aggregated uh, at really large levels of land um, for HIPAA regulations. Um, and so it's actually really difficult to understand real cancer rates um, in fence line communities, because if you're looking at a rural part of South Louisiana, um, the census tracts can be really, really huge and the emissions can vary widely across those tracts. So the fact that this famous industrial corridor was still kind of being questioned as a place where the air quality might not be that bad was really striking to me. And um, my colleague Al Shaw and I, we kind of had this question, well, like, can we actually figure out what the air is like at a really granular level, granular level, sorry, can we understand what it's like to breathe the air at the actual fence line? Um, at, you know, what we had realized was that most air pollution data, like I said, was aggregated at the same level of the cancer data, which is to say it's, it's sort of aggregated at the census tract and the county level. Um, and so we did some research and we discovered this data set called RSCI, the Risk Screening Environmental Indicators uh, data set. It's a model that the EPA publishes every year. It's a very little known model um, that has been around for almost three decades, but has been used very little. Um, and what's so amazing about this model is that it takes in emissions information um, as its input, along with other data like weather patterns and topography. Uh, and what it does is it, it outputs estimations of concentrations of toxic chemicals around industrial um, plants in these really tiny squares of land, so uh, less than half a kilometer wide. And when we discovered this data set, we were thrilled because we were like, oh, wow, you know, if we use this, we can actually say, you know, here is the industrial plant and here is the elementary school down the street. And we can understand, um, you know, a projection of what that elementary school could be actually experiencing. Um, and we can do it across a very wide range because um, air sampling and air monitors are very few and far between in the US and um, can't be relied upon for sort of a comprehensive understanding of the air quality in a region. Um, after we published that story, we started hearing from readers around the country asking us, oh, can you do my hometown? Can you do my hometown? Um, you know, we have this paper mill here. We have this cement plant. Um, and so we decided that we wanted to do a nationwide analysis using that model and that we wanted to do it in a bigger way. We wanted to do a five-year analysis. Um, and the reason we decided to do five years is because uh, we wanted to give people a sense of what chronic exposure looks like. If you just isolate one year of data, you know, maybe one company had a good year, maybe had a bad year. Um, but what we were really trying to measure and um, to sort of uh, just decimate basically to the public were these cancer risk estimations, these chronic lifetime cancer risk estimations. And so that required a more longitudinal analysis. The only problem was that with that was that the data was just so massive and complicated uh, that it was very difficult to process even um, that tiny strip of land in the lower Mississippi River was a huge challenge. So the idea of doing the whole country um, was a bit anxiety inducing. So, you know, to give you an idea, the one file of data um, is 120 gigabytes and it's like zip file format. So just trying to open it on our computers kind of crashed my computer. Um, and so what we had to do was uh, kind of get a little bit creative and use um, this Google supercomputer uh, 
platform to kind of process the data. And once we figured out how to do that, it took a while. Um, we decided that we wanted to write this algorithm that would basically um, identify hot spots of toxic air pollution. We were not only interested in sort of like where you know the pollution exists, but we wanted to try to understand you know can we quantify how many of these hotspots exist around the country? And so we wrote this little computer program that kind of um, dug through all of these little squares of data and batched them into these sort of contiguous hotspots. <clears throat> and I still remember kind of watching the data um, load up on my machine and kind of for the first time seeing this, the landscape, um, the topography of pollution in America. And, and I should have said this at the very beginning, but we're not talking about sort of car pollution here or um, the type of pollution that happens when you have really bad wildfires. We're talking about a very specific form of cancer causing pollution that is emitted by uh, large scale industrial facilities. And so what we were really looking at when that map loaded up was um, kind of uh, the topography of, of industrial America, essentially. Um, and it was staggering to us. We ultimately identified over a thousand hotspots of cancer causing industrial pollution. We found that a uh, quarter of a million Americans are estimated to be um, experiencing levels of cancer risk that the EPA considers unacceptable. And um, we also found that a fifth of all Americans are estimated to be experiencing cancer risk from industrial pollution at levels that the EPA says it strives to protect uh, the most amount of people possible. And what we also found when we looked at that data was that it was really kind of a gold mine for stories. I mean, every single one of those hotspots, in my opinion, is a story um, and we couldn't write all of them, um, but we were hopeful that our map would be sort of a resource for local journalists around the country to report on their communities um, and to understand what's going on there. Our map um, is a tool for people to not only understand what chemical plants are in their community, but what chemicals they emit, uh, what the estimated cancer risk is, um, uh, among other information. And we then, you know, after uh, identifying all the hotspots, we started taking trips to um, some hotspots on our map. And um, I'll say that some of the hotspots we expected to be there, for example, the Houston Ship Channel, and like I said, Cancer Alley, Louisiana, um, one of the largest. Um, but others were unknown to people who've been breathing the air for decades. And one reason for that is that um, not all chemicals are the same. Benzene has a really strong odor. It smells like gasoline and you can kind of tell when it's in the air, but a chemical like ethylene oxide is colorless and odorless and it can really be killing you and you're not, you don't even know what's happening. Um, so for example, in Laredo, Texas, we identified a really terrible medical sterilization plant that's been emitting huge amounts of ethylene oxide um, near uh, um, schools and, and no one had any idea that it was happening. So um, I guess finally, I will talk a little bit about uh, the impact that we got. So um, a couple of days after we published, uh, EPA Administrator Michael Reagan announced this toxic tour of the South, of the hotspots um, in the South and, and visited some that we identified on our map. Um, that town that I mentioned in Laredo, Texas formed a clean air coalition and has started pushing for school kids to have their blood tested. Um, in Verona, Missouri, the mayor of that town started campaigning uh, for a cancer study to be done. In fact, his wife has breast cancer um, and lives near a plant uh, that emits chemicals that have been linked to breast cancer. Um, we just found out two days ago um, or sorry, not two days ago, we just published a story two days ago um, about how his worst fears have actually been confirmed by the results of that study. And um, in earlier this year, the House of Representatives proposed a $500 million bill for air monitoring, um, which would allocate 100 million a year to states to, um, to um, monitor the air around toxic hotspots. Um, I will add that I think air monitoring alone is not enough. Um, but you know, it needs to be followed by sort of careful study of air monitoring results. And ultimately our series um, identified a lot of sort of regulatory problems and system problems that will require ultimately um, a lot more than um, an air monitoring bill, but real sort of um, thought by the EPA about how they can sort of design more regulatory hooks to um, reduce the emissions of facilities that have been identified to violate their own standards. You pinpointed like five companies that were responsible for a disproportionate 
amount of the industrial, not surprisingly, their biggest Dow Chemical, BASF, was their uh, response from those companies to the series? Um, yeah, so those companies sort of, and this kind of goes back to the regulatory uh, regime that I was just talking about. So those companies sort of repeatedly tell us that they're not in violation, that they're um, cooperating with state and federal standards. And in some cases, while many of those companies do actually have, you know, notices of violations pinned to their facilities year after year, a company like BASF, for example, uh, is correct in saying that it has not violated state or federal standards. And, you know, what's really striking is that the, the facility can operate within those standards and still violate that um, or, or still sort of generate cancer risk at levels that the EPA considers unacceptable, but continue to operate, um, you know, in uh, without sort of breaking the law. And so I think that disconnect, that sort of regulatory gap right there is, is one of, for me, the most striking things that, that we identify in our reporting and something that, um, I, I, the Michael Reagan told our reporter, Eva Kaufman, you know, is going to take uh, uh, many, many years of work to, to fix. Uh, well, speaking of regulatory failure, um, our next story sh shares some common health themes, which is uh, the story called Poisoned by the Tampa Bay Times with support from PBS's Frontline. And Corey Johnson is here to tell us about that story. Well, first of all, thanks for having me and having us. Uh, my name is Corey Johnson. I'm here representing the lead team, as we call ourselves at the Tampa Bay Times. Our partners, Rebecca Willington and Eli Murray. Um, and, and our story was att attempted to look at a, a local problem that had been off our radar. We had been reporting on lead poisoning or the issue of lead uh, in our local schools and our local school water. And when we got a tip from a health department source who gave us a report that uh, told us that the problem was far broader and that the county, uh, Hillsborough County, which we serve, uh, led the state of Florida in the number of adult lead poisoning cases, uh, which completely shocked us and we and fascinated us. We didn't quite know what that meant, what that looked like, what the source of it was. You know, most stories about lead poisoning deals with kids because lead as a, as a toxin and it can be incredibly damaging to young people. It can uh, create permanent brain damage in young people. But what we didn't know well, until we launched this investigation was that lead also is horrible for adults. That uh, it can wreck the cardiovascular system, the kidneys, and bring about even death in high enough levels and, and enough cases. And so as we're trying to figure out where is the source of this poisoning, we did some digging and found that in our backyard, uh, we had the state's only and last remaining lead smelter. It was a battery recycler that took, takes the batteries that are spent from your cars and other sources, breaks them apart, and then creates uh, lead products that it then sells to the military, hospitals, uh, 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 and, uh, gun manufacturers, and, and, and the like. And so once we begin to find out that this plant, which was owned, is owned by a company called Gopher Resource, we began to try to figure out how could we find out what's happening at this plant. And through this unique rule that the Federal uh, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, which is more commonly called OSHA, has, we learned that employees have these specific rights to get the medical testing and pollution testing that companies are required to do to handle toxic materials like lead, but it's not just lead. Uh, sometimes it's uh, cancer causing substances like cadmium or arsenic or the like. And so under this lead rule, if you will, um, employees had this right. We had to try to figure out how to get to employees and then how to convince employees to look into this to see if we could get a sense of what was happening. And over time, 
Uh, we were able to, to connect with well over 100 different people in various areas of the plant. And we began to see this amazing and horrifying paper trail that showed that on most days, the levels of lead and also uh, cancer-causing substances, arsenic, uh, cadmium, were sometimes hundreds of times higher than the federal limit and oftentimes far exceeded the protection equipment that the company had given them. These guys are walking around in spacesuits with respirators and, and uh, they look almost like stormtroopers you would see in Star Wars. Um, and, but yet, and they didn't know. The workers did not know. Their families did not know. And part of our journey was to try to figure out how this was happening and why it was happening. And during the course of that reporting, we found that hundreds had been overexposed to these toxins and workers were falling out, you know, almost daily and weekly and having to be hospitalized. Many of them, uh, at least during a five year period, well, hundreds, eight out of 10 workers had been exposed to levels that were so high that it would uh, put them at a, an increased risk for kidney damage and cardiovascular damage. And we were actually seeing that there had been within the last five years, uh, at least 14 workers who had had heart attacks and strokes, and many of them were young. There was a worker in his 30s and another worker uh, in his early 40s who uh, were having these, these things. And what was so powerful about the paper trail because of this required medical testing, we could see what the health of a worker was before they even started working at the plant. And then we could see over time how their levels of, of metals was just building up in their, in their bodies. And then ultimately we could see, because we had these workers give us at what we asked and they agreed to to get their medical records. Once we saw their medical records going to the hospital compared to the, the company's records that were required to be done by OSHA, we could literally trace a healthy worker and the moment they began to have real health challenges and how much lead was in their body. And so as we're following this paper trail, we're also trying to understand how could this happen? And in doing that, we we're, we're learning about all this. We're learning about an entire new world, a universe with pollution control um, equipment and regulations and requirements, water trucks driving around, pouring water on the ground and stuff that looked otherworldly. But beyond that, uh, workers began to share with us video and photo and once we could see, we could see for ourselves these amazing scenes where poisonous dust were, were so thick in the air that the workers literally couldn't see in front of them, that there were big dust avalanches of poison all over the place, but not just the poison. There was a, this almost uh, Upton Sinclair jungle environment inside that plant where uh, it was common for lead explosions to occur and molten metal to be flying and, and burning people left and right. So much so that there was this kind of perverse sense that you weren't really a real worker until you've had some molten lead splash and scald your body. So we met people who, who had these grotesque wounds from just simply working there. We, we saw for our own eyes uh, lead kettles exploding and spilling out lead, blow torches blowing up, uh, 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 little crates of lead slag exploding and people fleeing for their lives. So we could see a regulatory, we could see what happens when government doesn't show up. And as we fought, because we did have to fight with the federal government to get their records. Uh, it took us a good eight to 10 months before we got some records which were heavily redacted and didn't quite give a sense of what they did, how they did it. We had to then 
uh, work with our, our company sources to begin to plug the gaps. And thankfully, over time, we amassed, well, thousands of emails and pictures and even some documents and hard drives from government sources that, that rounded out that the federal government not only had abandoned this plant, but years prior when they did try to show up, they so botched the job, missing things, overlooking things, that uh, it essentially emboldened the company and created this environment. We heard from workers, well over 30 workers who talked about being coached to fool the regulators and all the various that they had had allegations that they had had inside sources, sources within the government that tipped them off. But beyond that, we could even see in the files that the government did release where OSHA was reaching out to the company and giving them weeks and weeks and sometimes months uh, of advance notice before they actually showed up to do an inspection. And so then there were big cleaning parties where employees in the dead of night are furiously cleaning up so that the plant would look good and safe by the time the government showed up. And so what we were able to do uh, over time was not only show this really horrible wrong that was happening and this culture that was happening inside the company, we were able to show how the government missed it and how they failed. Um, and, and one other point around the government's role in marching along and trying to understand this, we ultimately also learned that the government had benchmarks that were completely out of date and useless, so much so that the benchmarks, the things that the government, the metrics the government was using to try to assess whether a worker was safe or whether a plant was safe, was doing more to protect the company's budgets than they were to protect the actual workers. And so they had been set in the late 1970s and had never changed, they had never been updated. And as we speak right now, they still haven't been updated. And so the levels of what the government said was safe for lead, the amount of metal to be in someone's bodies is way beyond what medical experts and even the CDC says it's safe. And so we were able for the, maybe for the first time show in, in living color what that looks like, that people, human beings who had levels far lower than what the government says is unsafe were having incredible health problems. And there had even been a few deaths of workers who had heart attacks and other cancers and other things who on paper looked like they were safe according to the government's benchmarks, but according to medical science, they were absolutely being overexposed. And so that was the crux of the story. We eventually widened it out. Uh, the, the Times thankfully uh, paid for us to get uh, lead certification training. And we went to an EPA approved school and all three of us uh, thankfully got certified. I was scared because, you know, it's been a while since I've been in school. So, but I, even I passed the test and, and, and uh, got my certification. And we took that certification out to the community and we did our own soil testing and found levels in and around that community what that was much higher than what would, what would be seen or deemed to be safe. There's a, a community of well over 800 people of color and we could see that the plant, and when we looked at the documents and we looked at some of the internal records, that the plant had also poisoned the community's air, water, and land, uh, and had over a period of, of, of years began to hollow out that community uh, in order to, to advance its own economic interests. There's a school less than a mile away from the plant, and on paper, even though all this was happening, the, again, the regulators seemed to be uh, missing it. They seemed to think that the plant was okay. And when we engaged with the plant, they were very proud about their metrics around their outside pollution. But what we learned when we peeled back the layers on that was that uh, the plant had 
figured out for years when the federal government's uh, air monitors were cut on, that they knew the exact schedule that the, that the, these devices to collect pollution were turned on. They only turned on for one 24 hour period every six days. And so once the plant figured that out, they created calendars in advance and began to coach employees to alter their behaviors on the specific days that the monitors were on. And once we showed that, showed that there was this basic plot to undermine this testing to make their data look richer and better and safer than what it actually was, there was tremendous response. There was tremendous response in, in, in total to the story. Uh, there was the health department went in and did lead testing in the community to test kids to see if they were being impacted. Uh, two lawmakers called for OSHA to, to do uh, investigations immediately and they did and they spent a good four to six months in that plant and then confirmed everything that we had found and issued well over $300,000 in fines, which for OSHA and for the state of Florida was one of the highest fines in the last five or six years. The county environmental regulate, regulators went and did their own investigation and they too found everything that we found and just hit the plant with a proposed $837,000 in fines and is talking with them about requiring new technology that would uh, alert them automatically to problems. And it's talking with them about hiring experts to look at their ventilation systems because one of the findings in our story was that the ventilation system was bad. And because they had a bad ventilation system, the lead wasn't getting sucked up and, and removed from the workplace, hence workers were getting poisoned. Uh, but, but even beyond that, when the stories first hit, we got calls from investors and financial people, and that ultimately uh, manifested in the rating agencies doing their own separate investigations of the plant based upon what they could see in our stories. And Moody's, one of the most influential ones, downgraded the, the plant's credit and begin to kind of push internally for them to improve their performance and improve on the safety of the plant. The now, as, harrowing as, as harrowing as the account is, the fact that it had that impact across so many, you know, from private sector response to public is at least encouraging about the, you know, the impact that the reporting had and the, the possibility of stories like yours making, making a real difference. Um, so thank, thank you for that. Again, unfortunately, sort of similarly to Corey, to your reporting um, is what the Washington Post discovered about FEMA's conduct um, and its, its uh, oversight. So Hannah Dreyer uh, and Andrew Batran created FEMA's disasters uh, and Hannah, I wonder if you would tell us about what you discovered and what it took to discover about how another federal agency was going about its um, conduct and oversight work. Hannah? Yeah. Um, so, like you said, I'm here uh, representing FEMA's disasters, the Washington Post series that I reported with the help of Andrew Batran. Um, and it's such an honor to be on a panel with you guys who did so much of the work that I most admired this last year. I have so many questions for all of you about how you did that. Um, but this FEMA series, I think, sort of grew out of the same kind of work that really everybody who's spoken so far was doing, like looking at something and, and thinking, what's up with that? What's going on with that? That doesn't seem good. Maybe, maybe it's not. Um, in 2020, I had been reporting a lot in the field and I sort of kept overlapping with different natural disasters. So I was doing totally unrelated stories like in Louisiana when the hurricane hit, um, or I was in Alabama when some tornadoes hit. And I was looking around the next year to sort of think about what to do 
next. And um, I was talking with my editor, David Finkel, about all these natural disasters. And it turns out that last year there were more natural disasters basically than ever before. Like some 25 million people applied for help from the federal government, from FEMA, rebuilding after their homes were destroyed. Um, and FEMA was working with its biggest budget ever, which isn't surprising given what we know about climate change. And so we decided to start digging in and trying to figure out if FEMA was really serving the people that it was supposed to be serving. Like I'd read a lot of FEMA stories sort of about government waste, about things that went wrong during the early days of the pandemic. But I felt like nobody since Katrina had really dug in and just asked, is FEMA doing sort of the basic work of helping people after a disaster rebuild over the long term? And my idea was I was on this narrative team. So I thought we could sort of come in and tell a lot of these stories from the perspective of individual disaster survivors. And if we were lucky, individual FEMA workers, because I feel like so often that coverage is sort of like news clips of the disaster when it's at its most dramatic and people sort of are talking at their most shocked and, and traumatized about what they've just been through. But um, reporters don't often have the luxury, I think, of coming back and sort of asking, well, what happened six months later or a year later or three years later? Did these people get back on their feet? Did the government do basically what it's obligated to, which is help them after a huge federal disaster? And so what we found was so much worse than anything I imagined going into this. Um, I thought maybe we would do a story or two, but instead it was just like everywhere we look, there are these huge inequities. So we found that um, in the deep South, a lot of black families live on land that's informally owned. This is something that goes back to the Jim Crow era, basically when black people were excluded from the legal system. And all these years later, FEMA was denying people in these communities with twice the rate of other Americans because of these land issues. So in this one community I went to in Alabama, I felt like maybe half of people had been denied help after a tornado came through because FEMA basically didn't believe that they lived on land that their families had owned for generations and generations. And we also found that FEMA was just basically denying people at a higher rate than ever before. They were denying almost 90% of people who asked for help. Um, and this was another thing that hadn't been quantified before. Um, FEMA's approval rates aren't public and they stalled our FOIA requests. So Andrew Batran, who's a data reporter at the Post, found a way to sort of pull that data from FEMA's own website and quantify all of these numbers that we just hadn't known about before. So we exposed this skyrocketing rate in rejections. And then we also went and just hung around in the places that people were living after disasters. So I spent two and a half weeks embedded in a FEMA trailer park in California. And there were people there who had been sort of in, living in FEMA land for years and years. And hadn't made any progress toward getting a home or moving out of these trailers. And FEMA hadn't provided any way for them to get out of the trailers. They basically said, here's a trailer, it's super isolated. We're not gonna give you any social services. Try to find a home in this place where like your town has been burned down. Um, and so as we started putting up these stories, lawmakers started getting in touch with us to ask for our databases. Um, and researchers started to get in touch and eventually people from FEMA's own Office of Improvement started to get in touch. And they were saying, we don't have these numbers ourselves. Can you share them? Um, and as a result of these stories, things started to change. So lawmakers introduced a bunch of pieces of legislation. Um, the FEMA administrator had to come to the Hill for hearings. And then FEMA just re reversed some of the policies that they had told us they couldn't do anything about. So for example, within a couple of weeks of us publishing the story about um, black Americans not being able to get help because of title issues, FEMA just changed that policy. And now you don't have to show a title anymore to get help from the agency. Um, after we reported about people in these trailer parks, FEMA partnered with HUD to put people into apartments instead of trailers. And again, this was a situation where FEMA had initially said, no, there's nothing we can do, our hands are tied. 
Um, so for me, it was really a lesson in trusting that if you can get the space to go deep, things really can change, even with a sort of famously bureaucratic, um, dysfunctional agency like, like the one that we focused on. You talk about being able to get access to numbers that other people at FEMA didn't themselves have. How did that work? Well, so I think part of this is just FEMA is a huge agency that doesn't talk to itself that much. So there was somebody in FEMA that could have just handed us these numbers at any point, could have you know, published them on the website. They now are publishing them. Uh, lawmakers introduced legislation requiring that FEMA be more transparent about this. But at the time that we were doing this reporting, um, they just were holding them very close. I think it's sort of a very suspicious agency that doesn't get a lot of critical press coverage. And so what Andrew was able to do is scrape these numbers from sort of a dormant website that FEMA had. Um, and he pulled 9.5 million records and then compared them with census data so that we could really see where those equity issues were happening. And that's just an analysis that, that hadn't been done on that scale before. And so then P FEMA does have people that are supposed to watch out for, for discrimination and equity problems. And they took our database and started using it to make changes. I should say we published that database. We did not give our work product to a government official in some back channel way like that is public on our website. Right. Yeah, it's just a terrific, you know, again, um, helping the government get better at doing what it's supposed to be doing in the first place is just an extraordinary um, outcome of this series. Um, and then our Final one, again, you can, I, I, as you all listen, I hope you can appreciate why our judges uh, faced such a difficult time because each of these series, each of these stories um, represents such incredible initiative and enterprise. Our final one uh, is called Unresponsive. So we go from Washington now to Wichita, to the Wichita Eagle, where uh, Michael Stavola can tell us about how they discovered what was going on in the Wichita Area uh, Emergency Services. So, Michael. Hello. Hey, thank you so much. Yeah, uh, we're really honored. I really enjoyed getting to read all of your guys' stories. You guys did incredible jobs, and we're uh, we're just honored to be uh, among the finalists here. So, our story is about the mismanagement of our county's EMS and how that um, just led to putting lives in jeopardy with each emergency call. And so, uh, it started when um, it, it all started when I got a tip about a uh, suicide call where the person was left for hours to die even though they were still breathing. And I started looking into that and I started getting more and more tips about how um, people were just very unhappy with the leadership and how that came about. And all these people were leaving and uh, it was just leaving EMS's uh, ambulances not being filled and so there was many times we started hearing on the scanner as we were digging into this, you could start hearing uh, more and more often status zero, which meant there was no ambulance for a town of 500, 000, for a county of 500,000 people. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so we started digging into this and right away when I started making calls on this, uh, I, right away we started getting pushed back. Um, the Sedgwick County uh, Medical Director, or Sedgwick County, uh, the oversight board of our of our uh, county uh, of our EMS system, um, that executive director had reached out to our editor and tried to kind of say that uh, maybe people were pushing their agenda on me, and um, so yeah, we started getting pushed back right away, and as we started digging, we just really found that uh, the EMS employees they had been trying to raise alarms about um, the new EMS director uh, before he was even put in place. Um, they had had, um, they just were concerned about his judgment and his leadership. That suicide call really enforced that. And uh, that's, you know, really just showing that um, they had already questioned his leadership. And a few months after that, he ended up being put in charge and they merged the departments. He was the medical director. They merged the uh, office, of, uh, office of the medical director and the uh, EMS director into one and put him in charge. And so, um, we really just found as we started digging in that 
county leaders and elected officials are really reluctant to just take this evidence that was being presented to them. Uh, we found one time we heard about uh, some of them had brought a petition about not wanting him to be their leader and to open it up for uh, for um, a national search. And a county commissioner had crumbled up that petition and threw it in the garbage and told him to get out. And so we just kept hearing, uh, we just really saw a reluctance on uh, county officials and, and elected officials to really like see this data that's being presented to them. And um, we, we also found that some of this, uh, sorry if I'm, I'm jumping back and forth here, I should have written it out a little better, but uh, we, we also found that the medical director um, some of this exodus of employees had appeared to be by choice. He had wrote a, a proposal that was supposed to save them money by uh, switching over from this system. They called it a two paramedic system. So they had two paramedics on, on each ambulance to doing a paramedic and an EMT. This would save money. And he was saying that studies showed uh, that it wouldn't have an adverse effect on, um, on outcomes, patient outcomes. And at this point, the, the two paramedic system we found as we researched was pretty rare, but it's also what we felt made our, our EMS system so robust. They were nationally renowned. They were very well known for uh, being a progressive uh, EMS department and things they were doing. And we found that since he took over and all these people left, response times were just plummeting. Uh, it, it was just getting to a very scary situation the employees were starting to, um, they were not allowed to talk to us, but uh, we, we could tell they exhausted other options and, and they were coming forward to help us. So uh, we could just see that the situation was getting really dire for, for them. And, and they started talking to us um, and, and really starting to help us kind of form a better picture of, of what was going on. Um, we ended up looking through about 500,000 EMS response calls, uh, uh, over 10,000 of this marvelous system, which gives you like a more granular look at, uh, at, at calls. You can take a specific call and see how many ambulances were available uh, at the time and how long calls were holding. Uh, we had, I don't know, we did fifth, probably interviewed 50 people, had uh, tens of hours of uh, leaked recordings uh, from conversations. Uh, hours more of recordings. And um, yeah, so after our stories published, a uh, week before our story published, the deputy chief who, one of the deputy chiefs he had put in charge had uh, resigned. Uh, days after our story, uh, the director resigned. There was lawmakers were writing our county, pressuring them to, to make some changes. Uh, our, the stories were being reported in trade magazines. Um, they ended up County commissioners ended up proving uh, signing bonuses, increased pay for paramedics. Paramedics started coming back, which was really amazing. So they've started to build up from, from a lot of the people they le that left. Um, they started an education program as an incentive. Um, what else happened? Yeah, I think that kind of sums up what. No, it's just, a ter again, a, a really terrific example of um, what patient, diligent, tireless, enterprising reporting can do in what, again, are life and death stakes. And, you know, in, in the case of each of these stories, I think that um, as harrowing as many of your accounts are in this sort of my reaction each time is sort of how can that be? How can that have been what was happening? How can that have been okay? It is so heartening to see um, the impact that your work has and the inspiration that it, it uh, provides, I hope, to aspiring journalists who are listening and to aspiring policymakers. Um, I'm gonna open the floor to questions and I'm gonna start while anyone who wants to put a question in the Q&A, please do. Uh, Carmen Noble, who leads our journalist resource team has some really interesting ones, um, starting with how the reporting these stories affected you personally, and whether you have advice for journalists about how they can protect their own mental health and when they're covering really traumatic stories. Who would like, who would like to address that? Well, I can jump in to tell you that um, on, on, from our perspective, I mean, there, 
it, it is, it's traumatizing when we do. I mean, I think all of us that tell stories that, that do the work that we do, we do try to put ourselves in the shoes of others as best as we can. And it does take a toll. I mean, I've been in tears for literally weeks of late. I'm working on a follow-up story on a family that it's just the most horrific story. And um, it's just had me just literally in tears. Um, so it, it is, I mean, it's a challenge. I think having um, people to talk about it with, colleagues um, that understand our work, um, I think is really, I think it's very important to have an outlet to be able to discuss that because it is, I think. Um, and then we also are just, you know, we're also careful not to re-traumatize the people that we're, that we're writing about. So there's just, we're surrounded by, you know, heartache a lot. And so um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a valid question. And I think more and more in our newsroom, we have, um, um, we have, I think we're, we're more aware of it that we talk with each other about, I think um, an assignment was given to one of our reporters recently on uncovering a sexual assault. And she just said, you know what, I've been writing about sexual assault for so long. She said, I can't, I can't do this one. So being able to speak up and say like, actually, I can't do it right now. I've had like, so having boundaries and having an outlet, I think is, is helpful. I find it really helpful lately to focus on main characters who are sort of taking a proactive role in their own situation. So like with these FEMA stories, people were really suffering. People were constantly crying, you know, like everybody, I think <laughs> on this panel experience, but they were also really fighting and trying to advocate for themselves. And I, I took a lot of comfort in sort of also showing that resilience and, and focusing on that part of what they were going through. I mean, I wonder how somebody like Corey deals with it when you're in the same story for, it sort of, it sounds like maybe two years before you're starting to publish and sort of get that satisfaction that comes from publishing. Like that seems like also such a hard mental game to live with that sort of trauma reporting and just be in the trenches of it for, for that long. Impress, impressive, but it seems hard. Yeah, I was going to to jump in to say that that both uh, both of you all have made some uh, tremendous points. Self care is a thing. Um, it's a it's a growing conversation na nationally, and it's a overdue conversation inside of the journalism space. And what I'm beginning to realize, because I've struggled with it personally over the course of my career, and what I've come to realize is that. It's very helpful if people have their own independent sources of joy, separate from the news, separate from the feeling you might get on the story. You need, if you don't have some other thing outside of this news that can put back into you when the job and life takes out of you, it's going to be rough for you. Like, you know, hobbies, you know, relationships fun things, things that just purely bring you joy. You need that if you're going to be successful and, and, and healthy going to the next story and the next project. Otherwise, uh, this will run you down. It'll take you out. It'll burn you out um, and you'll be no good to nobody. Um, there's a question for Michael. Uh, how did you find the families that you featured in your series and how'd you get them to talk to you and to trust you? Um, yeah, so that was, one of those was really interesting to me, probably one of the things I'll always remember about it. So uh, we had, uh, you know, a lot of uh, paramedics are helping us out. And um, one of them had brought to me a story about a, a kid who had, a 10 month old who had died and my wife was pregnant at that point. We just had our, our first daughter. So it's uh, starting to mean a lot more for me looking back on this story now to, to seeing how young the kid was. Uh, paramedics thought that he, if, if, if they had gotten there sooner, he, he, would have, uh, he would have survived. And they were able to, paramedics were eventually able to get, um, get the baby breathing again. The baby had rolled over in his sleep and uh, had lost consciousness. And um, so I had actually had, a, had gotten about this call uh, so I knew that the location of it. And so I went there, um, every Friday and Saturday for probably a month and I'd, I'd knock on the door and then I'd leave a note on the door and, uh, it was in a trailer park. I couldn't find any public way of finding a name associated with that address. And so, uh, one of the times I was at a dead end road. I, I went up, I knocked and I turned around at the end of the cul-de-sac and I, I was coming back and I saw the note was gone. I was like, they're home. So I got out and I, I knocked on the door again and I, I 
I don't know what the, that, that one was real interesting. I kind of, I kind of just think that's one of the things I just, maybe I look real nervous on here, but I've always felt I did really well with people. And I was convinced that if I got in front of them and I could tell them why their story was so important uh, that they would talk to me. And I, I knocked on door, I explained to the, he's a young, young father and he broke down in tears and just started talking to me about, uh, about what happened to them. So it was through paramedics helping though. They, they knew that there was a, a dire problem and, and we were looking for these calls about where um, poor response times had, had um, affected the outcome. And Raquel, you talked about the people's willingness to, I'm amazed that someone shows up at your door, says they're a reporter and they've got an electrician. Can we come in and inspect your, your wiring that of how many people were sure, come on, <laughs> come on in with sort of, you know, I found that remarkable. Yeah, we did too. We were very surprised. We did not know what to expect when we first went out. We, we didn't know if we'd get one or two or if we'd get 10. And we, we, you know, we wanted, we were tempted to keep going because, um, because people were so receptive to it. Um, but because of COVID and things were kind of ramping up and sensitive time-wise, we kind of cut it off. We had, a, um, what was surprising to us was a, a big enough um, response to make it statistically valid, which was our main, our main goal was to make sure we had enough to be able to really have draw some conclusions about what was happening in these rental properties. So yeah, people were really grateful. I mean, people had, it was surprising. They had lived through previous fires and they were just so thankful that someone was willing, because I think there had been a lot of blaming of, um, you know, of the tenants where you've got people that are forced to use extension cords. And, and so a lot of times we would find, um, you know, the report saying overuse of extension cords and blaming the tenants. Well, when you look, when you peel the layers back and look at why they're using extension cords, it's because there's one outlet that might work in the whole place. And so, you know, there, there aren't a lot of options. And so, yeah, I mean, it just, um, and you had, a, you had a group of people that didn't have a lot of choice also on where to live because a lot of people had evictions or criminal records. So you had a captive group of people that did not have, have choices. So um, I it felt good to be able to expose that. So Christoph says he's currently writing his thesis on journalistic impact, something we all pay a lot of attention to. So he's curious how you tracked the impact of your stories. Who wants to take that? Layla, you want to take that one? Sure. Um, I think it really happens quite naturally um, after you work on something for so long because you develop a, a source base of experts and um, people who are very involved in the policy world um, who will sort of um, you know, keep you in the loop and, and you'll know before the public does about the legislation that um, is about to be proposed, um, the regulations, the reforms that are going to change. And then in terms of the sort of on the ground impact in the local communities where we spend time reporting, um, I'm a big believer in, in, in sort of always following up with those places and asking what's been happening on the ground after the story published. And so we just kept up with the people that we know in Verona, Missouri and Laredo, Texas, right? Um, and, and all those other communities that we spent time in. And so um, I think that's that's always just a, um, a good thing to do is, you know, you never really like say this, a formal goodbye to your sources that you kind of keep up with them and try to understand how their lives are changing um, after the story publishes. So um, that's kind of, and, and then of course, you know, we have a document where we keep up, we, we jot down all the impact that we get, whether it's regulatory or smaller scale, um, local kind of changes at the chemical plant level. So we do have a, a collaborative document where we're, you know, we, we keep up with that stuff, but it really, I think kind of, uh, it's just fed from that, that source base that you've spent so much time developing as you're reporting. You know, Maribah, I'm curious that when the news about what happened at Hapa, you know, arresting eight-year-olds and handcuffing little girls first broke, and you, you noted it was a big story at the time, and yet years passed before it seemed <laughs> that there were any consequences and it took what you guys did in order to actually get people to, to mm -hmm. stop and say, okay, this is, this is just too much. How do you account for what it took to have the, um, the accountability finally kick in? 
Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, this is one of those stories that had some really big um, changes made by fe federal lawsuits. You know, the filter system at the jail was stopped. Um, this policy of arresting kids and bringing them immediately to the detention center stopped. But um, that was because of, you know, federal judge issuing injunctions and permanent injunctions and solitary confinement. We cover that in the story. They had a horrible track record of, of solitary confinement with children that was also stopped um, by a federal lawsuit. Um, but it really shows how difficult it is to make real change, right? So you can do some things through the federal court system, but then nobody really, um, it speaks to the culture too, right? Where it's like, oh, we can be slapped with hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars in settlement payments, but we're just going to keep chugging along here um, until, you know, a big print story or a big story comes out. And then it's like, oh, we're shamed into changing things. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's still shocking me. One thing I didn't talk about initially was just the lack of oversight on the state level. That was a huge thing. And that continues to be a huge thing that I, uh, I have channeled a lot of frustration into. And we talk about kind of what to do with your feelings <laughs> after talking to tons of children who have been traumatized by like tons of children. I mean, thousands of children have been traumatized by the system. And um, what do you do with all that? Like you can only come of age once, right? Well, then you know, when I think about how the state level has stopped uh, publishing data on juvenile courts, um, and so we'd never be able to spot a story like this one, or how, you know, the filter system was in a pr printed document and the state inspectors every year failed to notice it. Um, you know, these things are so frustrating and they still exist, like the data gap still exists. So, um, you know, the state is still doing an abysmal job at overseeing these facilities and actually doing things of consequence. You know, here we have an illegal system on paper and they're saying, oh, well, there's no graffiti, so it's good. Give them a license. You know, um, I think that it's been both rewarding, but also pretty disappointing to see that it took this long for any kind of change. Um, I know from, you know, the lawyers, I mean, one of the interesting aspects of the story was that the three lawyers who kind of were all involved in these federal lawsuits and these seven federal lawsuits, two of them came out of this very juvenile court. So they kind of turned around and, you know, stabbed it in the back and tried to take it down, which is a great story. Um, but, you know, when they see kind of their work um, ultimately kind of getting shoved under the rug and, and things are stopping and payments are coming out, but like the judge is still there, the jailer's still there, the commissioners are still doing their thing. And then a big story comes out and everybody's like, oh my gosh. Um, it's like, well, come on, we've been, you know, we've been talking about this, but at the same time, it speaks to the power of journalism, right? We were able to actually use these lawsuits, use the data holes we found, use the records we, we, we you know, over 50 public records requests that we put in and to craft this really powerful narrative. I mean, it, it really speaks to the power of storytelling, I think, which at the end of the day, you know, this might be an investigative reporting panel, but I kind of just call myself a storyteller because I think stories grab us and they allow us to empathize. And uh, when you can do that, it's, it's pretty amazing the changes that can happen. Uh, so yes, it's been many years since this happened. And a lot of people were like, this happened five years ago. And we we're like, yeah, but look at how much is still inadequate so much like at this point in Tennessee we have 98 juvenile courts we have no idea what is happening in any of them because that critical number that we use in our story where 48 percent of the cases were being referred to juvenile court that statewide kind of uh, report has not been produced for eight years so we have no idea what's happening this could be happening anywhere it's just that these federal lawsuits and everything else that happened kind of allowed us to 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 really dive into this place. So um, change is really hard. It's really, really hard. <laughs> um, so here's a question. Maybe I'll start with Corey, but then invite any of you to weigh in. Um, in interviewing sources on the ground over the years, have you seen any overall changes, positive or negative, in attitudes towards journalists? So Corey, you, you were embedded, you were so close to people yeah. you were reporting on for so long. So I'm curious about what you encountered at first and whether that evolved over time. So the answer is uh, it evolved over time. Yes, I've seen uh, improvement over the arc of the stories and over the arc of the relationship. But uh, 
but initially it was very hostile. Uh, initially, uh, people, you know, this enemies of the people propaganda and fake news stuff has really kind of taken hold. And it's taken hold uh, in concert with real missteps that journalists have taken uh, broadcast and print over decades. And so uh, there's the question of news literacy. A lot of folks, uh, particularly a lot of the people that we were talking to, they're, they're not newspaper subscribers, so, so to speak. And so uh, they're not really plugged in like that. Um, and so uh, for uh, many, many months, I had to kind of dispel the, the thinking or the, or the fear that I was not really a newspaper reporter, but actually the FBI in disguise. Um, and so uh, there was a lot of reluctance and a lot of fear and a lot of uh, mistrust. And I can say that with those sources, it got better, uh, but it's only a small dent in what I think is, is happening in our community and communities nationwide. I mean, so I think one of the, the biggest takeaways, uh, and, and it, it kind of saddened me, was how wide the gap truly is between news organizations and the communities that, uh, that we purport to serve. Um, and I don't really have the answers uh, around how we reverse that other than I think these stories help. I think these efforts help, uh, but it's the problem is so vast. I, I wouldn't want to uh, uh, sing Hosanna, Hosanna and, and be misleading. Uh, there are large swaths of people who absolutely don't trust us. They don't believe us. They don't think that we're here to serve them. Um, and I'm thankful that in our space, in, in our particular story and in our spaces, we've done a lot to change that, but it's so big. I don't quite know how it, it gets undone, frankly. Does that resonate with others of you, what Corey's describing? I mean, I think one thing that has been heartening to me, while I do often encounter that same issue of people thinking I'm fake news or I'm a spy, is I think with social media, it's become much easier to get in touch with the people who really want to talk. Like with these FEMA stories, FEMA said, no, you can't talk to anybody in their whole organization. Um, but because things like LinkedIn exist, I was able to go around and contact, you know, if I wanted to talk to somebody doing one job, I could reach out to 200 people doing that job. And like 20 of them would say, oh, I've been waiting for a reporter to call. I'm so outraged about this thing going on. I just, where have you been? And that's something that I would never have been able to do 10 years ago. And the, you know, organizations that we're reporting on, they can't stop that. Um, so that for me has just become a huge reporting tool. Michael or say, Merba, yeah. I would just say for me, a lot of the time I'm reporting in pretty kind of marginalized communities and a lot of times the only, uh, only time a reporter comes is when there's a shooting, when it's often TV news and being a radio reporter, they always think I have a microphone, they're like, is that a camera? And I'm like, no, no. Um, but, you know, I think my biggest tool, so, so the mistrust isn't, for them, it's not anything new, right? It's been built up over years and years and years of kind of the narrative around their community and the people kind of coming in for their worst moments. And I think what I work really hard to do is be there for all the moments, the good moments, the bad moments. I mean, I really like to embed. And so, um, I think when you just keep coming back, that often dissipates and they realize that you are not, you don't have a preconceived narrative and that you're gonna listen. And, and it's just amazing how many people ultimately want to tell their stories when they feel that you're genuine. So um, that's been always kind of a really helpful tool for me, which is just, if you've got the time, don't be in the office, be out in the field. <laughs> I would just jump in to add right onto that. I think that's exactly right. And um, what we encounter too, I mean, I just feel like we, so often we don't live and do life with people that we are covering and we don't always live in the communities that we're writing about. And so the more we can live and do life with people that we are covering, <laughs> uh, whether it's going to church with people that you don't normally, you know, or just going to, you know, shopping in grocery stores, we or even like relocating and living with people that you're, you know, we're really trying to intersect our lives more um 
in a way that that um, is it just more integral to who we're covering. So they, they, that's kind of a concerted effort that that I myself and a couple of my colleagues are really talking about and focusing on of late. So I think that could be helpful because there is such a different world that, that we don't, you know, if we don't live it, it's really hard. It's hard to to come together that way. So. Well, as I said at the outset, because we are out of time, but I, I think you've given everyone not only good reason to read your incredible stories, um, but to come back next week and get to uh, another chance to celebrate this work. I often remind my students that the press is the only constitutionally protected industry, and there's a reason for that. And everything that you have done and talked about today is a reminder about the critical, critical role that newsrooms, large and small, all over the country are playing. And it is, it is honestly an honor to get to hear from you and learn from you and be inspired by the work that you've done. So I look forward uh, to seeing you in person next week. And in the meantime, uh, thank you so much for the spending some time with us today to help understand what went into this incredible work. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.